for the rain. All right. Okay, I'm Bob Goddard, that person. Um, this is in, uh, one, in a, one in a series of uh, talks about uh, the old-fashioned view of computing, which is computing, doing a whole lot of arithmetic, as opposed to uh, data handling, or searches, or all of the stuff that computers are mostly used for. My focus, you know, my whole career has been scientific technical computing, where you're really crunching massive numbers, mostly floating point numbers. And the, and the point is to do them correctly. And second criteria, fast. Um, this is mostly about correctly, and you know, I touch on fast occasionally. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, I'm going to start with a, a sort of model problem. Uh, by the way, I gave some of this talk last October to a very small audience because there was a big storm. And, and, uh, Curve level about the available. <laughs> um, but uh, so so the, the latter part of this talk, well, it has a lot, of, a lot of overlap with that talk. The first part of this talk is is, is new uh, to this to this event. Um, so that we're talking about a model problem, uh, and and this model problem is the is a subset of the problems that I've spent much of my career working with, in fact, is a simulation of a, of a passive sonar system um, with a moving source and a moving receiver uh, where the trajectories are specified by the person who wants to do the simulation as a sequence of snapshots. With Six degrees of freedom plus first, plus first time derivatives uh, at, a, at a series of times, and you, you have to interpolate between those in order to, to actually do the simulation. Uh, and the input and output are signals uh, that are specified also as discrete samples. This is something that that comes up. Almost any time you compute something is that you don't is that underlying your model is a is something that's continuous that's happening. Uh, but what you're actually working with when you're doing computation are discrete samples at discrete times or discrete values of some independent variable. Um, and so now both one of our inputs, which is the signal that our source is emitting, and the signal that we're receiving are expressed as discrete samples, but not on the same grid. Uh, because, because they're moving, so the delay changes with time. OK, so uh, and uh, it was, it's, it's fundamentally similar to, to the, the, uh, the problem that I, that I used for, for October's talk. Oh, my pilot just fell on the floor. Boo -boo. Um, <laughs> uh, which, which is an airplane, uh, an airplane uh, with, a, with a camera attached to it following someone on the ground and reporting the position of this moving vehicle on the ground in Earth coordinates after following it with a camera flying around. So there are lots of coordinate transformations in that scenario uh, to do anything with that. Either, either to simulate the thing, which is what I'm, <coughs> the end of it that I'm more familiar with, or to actually run the system and report the position of this person on the ground. It's the same equations run forward and backwards. Uh, I didn't want to step on that um, But they're basically the same problem. Uh, okay. And, and the, this talk is going to be in two parts. One, the first part is, is a general treatise on interpolation. 
Uh, in the second part, we'll get more specific about, about uh, coordinate transformations and rotations in particular, since that's the hard part of the interpolation. Um, okay. We start with uh, a conceptually continuous signal. This is, this is a tone that's tenor G. It's, it's, got, it's two seconds long. Uh, it sounds about like G is about here. That's pretty much what it sounds like. Um, it's actually a little higher than that. Uh, I don't have perfect pitch. <laughs> um, the, and you can write this down. Uh, the symbol equation. The Han window is just a cosine squared multiplier. Uh, the Han, um, this is a very narrow band signal, but it's finite. And as as a as a as a as a problem to work with, it's very clean because you don't have to worry about what's going on at the ends. Uh, and you can, if, if there are side lobes out there, and there's lots of clear space that's supposed to have zeros in it, and if it doesn't, you see it. Uh, <laughs> and so, so it's a good, it's a good kind of a signal to use to to either diagnose any problems you're having with simulation, or to just talk about simulation and see the consequences of your of your uh, talk about interpolation and see the consequences of your decisions. Now. Um, You'll see this, this particular uh, diagram is the first of a series, and they're all going to have the same format, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. Um, the top one is, that's the whole signal. It's, it's uh, sampled at, vastly oversampled. Uh, more, many more samples closer together than they need to be for this kind of a narrow band signal. <clears throat> but this is this. You can think of this as continuous, um, and um, the first one is the whole signal. The second one is a little snippet out of the middle of it, so you can see what's actually going on. And, and it's, if, it's, if it's in the it's in the middle, it has a has the full amplitude. And the amplitude is changing very slowly on the scale of the of the length of the signal. Uh, or, excuse me, changing slowly on the scale of the, of the oscillations. Uh, so it's basically a sine wave, cosine wave. Um, the third box here uh, is the, an FFT of that entire signal. Fast Fourier transform, so it goes from the time domain to the frequency domain. And we can see how narrow band it is, but you know there there are two peaks. This the the <clears throat> this one goes from minus five kilohertz up to five kilohertz because that's what you get when you take an FFT of a, re, of a Fourier transform of a real signal. Yes. Well, what is a negative frequency? The mathematical construct that comes out of the arithmetic. It's normally but it's there in the band. And, and sometimes it's important to keep it in mind when you're doing the math. It, <laughs> because, because for a real signal, I mean, we use it because, now if you do a Fourier transform of a real signal, what you get is, is something that has a, a positive part, that is the part that most people focus on, that, that actually has physical reality to it. Uh, and the negative part, which is equal to the positive, equal to the complex conjugate of the positive part, mm -hmm. backwards. Uh, so it's, it's conjugate symmetric. Which means that if you multiply this one by e to the i omega t, and you multiply that one by e to the minus i omega t, and, the, and it's the same omega plus or minus, uh, if you sum those together with the same amplitude, then, then the imaginary parts cancel out, and you get only the real part. So, so uh, the FFT of a symmetric uh, 
excuse me, the, the FFT of a real is, of a real signal is conjugate symmetric. And the IFFT, the inverse FFT of a symmetric signal is necessarily real. Okay, now here's a, and the, the last line that is on the left is a, is a blow up of the, uh, around that, that one uh, peak. Um, and they all, these all look the same. It's at 196 hertz, which is that G, uh, tenor G in the, near the top of the bass clef. Um, and, um, and you see it's got a, a, a narrow peak and two side lobes next to each other. That is real. That's not a, a numerical thing. But because that is the shape of the Fourier transform of the envelope, that cosine squared thing that, that multiplies the whole thing. So this is the FFT of the envelope. And that is the FFT of the whole signal. Yes. In the second uh, plot there, that it kind of looks like a slinky spring. Is that significant, or, or is it supposed to be a pure sine wave? Oh, it's. Oh, it's. Uh, it's supposed to be a pure sine wave, cosine actually, since it's, it's one at one. But uh, it. Just the way. That you know, those the little <coughs> circles are data points. Oh, I mean, okay. uh, you'll see you'll yeah. see in, in subsequent. I, I plotted it this way with points rather than a line, just to, to emphasize that these are, these are individual numbers. Uh, they blend into a line uh, in, in, this, in this version of it, but not in subsequent ones. You'll see it different later. Yeah. But I wanted to make, the, make, it, make it obvious when we're talking about the line and when we're talking about data points. Uh, and the last one, that? Oh yes, it's the same thing in uh, uh, is, is the amplitude of this real parts only in decibel form. So it's just the amplitude, not the phase, and uh, of ten log of the intensity, ten log of the amplitude squared. Basically, is what this is, and it varies. You can see this is this is uh, 50 hertz from the top of this, uh, 50 50 dB from the top to the bottom. Since it's a logarithmic scale, what that means is that it is it is a factor of ten to the fifth between that peak, ten, ten, more than ten to the fifth between that peak and anything else on the entire spectrum. <laughs> that peak is basically all there is, and it's all around. All the rest is zero. This is very clean, and this is what, this is sort of the, the test signal that we're starting with. But we're going to start with something that looks. But the, the what we what people who do this sort of stuff actually use is something that looks more like this. This is the same signal sampled at a sample rate that's a lot closer to what people would actually use in the field if they were trying to get two samples of the signal like this one. Uh, it's uh, with a 500 hertz <coughs> sample rate. Remember, this is at about 200, 196 hertz is where this is. Uh, so a 500 sample rate is two and a half times, the sample rate is two and a half times the, the one and only frequency that's actually there in the signal. Uh, and it has to be at least two times to satisfy the Nyquist criterion that says that it is possible to recover our original signal on slide one out of those numbers. Because our signal is band limited. There really is nothing at, at higher frequencies. Uh, and the, the sampling rate is somewhat over the Nyquist, and one and a quarter times the Nyquist limit. Uh, excuse me, the, the, is, the, the Nyquist sampling rate for this signal, the minimal sampling rate, would be 400. Uh, and we went up to 500. The, when people actually work with, with sample signals, computing things with them is not the problem. The problem is transmitting them from here to there. So you want to have as few samples <laughs> as you can get away with. <laughs> uh, 
and if you can do something else after they arrive to fill them in, uh, then then you're you're home free. So, and that's that's the interpolation. Okay. Um, and it, so the the next next few slides will be trying to recover our original signal from these. How do you do it? Um, okay, you can you can just take the nearest neighbor. So there's there's our nearest neighbor interpolation, <laughs> uh, and we see that the FFT has a lot has all of this cruft in it, this junk. <laughs> Those are side lobes. Uh, and there's a little bit of jiggle around, you know, background jiggle here also. <clears throat> and the, the, the first uh, the, the first side lobe is only about 60 d down from the main peak. It, it's very bad. <laughs> okay. So you probably don't want to do it that way. Next, linear interpolation. Everybody knows how to do linear interpolation. Well, it's better, but it's still not very good. Uh, it's continuous now. At least it doesn't have jumps in the values. But the first derivative is discontinuous. It's got peaks in it. Uh, and uh, if, we, if we go back and forth between this one and this one, we can see that the side lobes are less than they were. And the junk is, it looks better, but you, you don't want it this, this way. OK. Um, you, you can, there's a way you can make the first derivative continuous also, so that there are no corners in it. You do that by using a cubic interpolator, uh, and which requires four input points for each output point. And each output point is a linear combination of four input so, so the, the, that's the, the order is three because you were talking about cubic polynomials, but a cubic polynomial has four parameters in it. Zero. Okay. Um, it's better, but it doesn't look right. <laughs> it looks distorted, and it's still got this one side lobe that's that's down uh, at um, minus nine dB, which which is a factor of about nine, about eight maybe, uh, in, in, in intensity. Uh, which isn't real good, but that's what it was. And there was only one lonely side lobe down about 45. Down, excuse me. Yeah, about 45 way out there. So you still don't want to do this. Now, with at, at this point, we we shift to a different kind of a, a sampling. The, the, for, those were all polynomials. Uh, this is a um, windowed sink function, and I meant to make a plot of what that looks like. We will see approximately. You'll, you'll see later what, what it looks like. But what it is, is just a, uh, a sine wave that goes through 0 at, at 0, multiplied or divided by uh, the argument of the sine wave. Uh, and so at the end, it's zero over zero. It's low. So when you're using that approach, are you making an assumption that your base signal is a sine wave? No. Okay. You're making an assumption that your base signal is band limited. Okay. That, that whatever it contains, there's nothing significant in it above... Above a certain frequency. The, this, above some, some point. It's, yeah. got, it's got some zero space at the top okay. of, the, of the spectrum, at the ends of the spectrum. Um, and, uh, but, but it's multiplied by another one, another one of these Han uh, envelopes just, just to smooth it out and make it finite length, uh, which the sync function is not finite length. And, but so this is order seven, so we use eight, eight input points. And again, it's a bit better down to minus 20 for that first side lobe. Uh, but it still looks kind of weird. What does it take? What it takes is 15. It takes 15 input points, 16 input, input samples for every output point. Um, and it, it turns out that there's a rule of thumb 
that allows you to predict this. Uh, and, uh, and this nailed it. He nailed it. Um, the rule of thumb is that the, the, the fraction, okay, you, you've got your Nyquist range from zero to uh, half the sample rate. The actual signal is 80% of that. So what's left up here is 20%. That's, that's at the end of the spectrum, it's clear. It's got zeros in it. Okay, you have to have some of that in order to, to have finite length interpolation actually work for you. Uh, and that clear space is one fifth of the total spectrum. Okay, so clear fraction is 0.2. So two and a half times five is about twelve and a half. Fifteen is about that. You know, and fifteen is just what I normally use for this kind because that formula, where where your actual signal goes up to about eighty percent of the Nyquist limit, is common in the industry. That's that's the way people do it, and that takes fifteen. <laughs> Uh, to do a really clean. Now, sometimes you don't need something this clean, so you can get away with less. So if you're if you're performance criti if you're, if you're performance critical, uh, you can sometimes get by with a little bit less than that rule of thumb calls for. But that's that's what I tell people. That's what you gotta use. Um, but there's another way to do the same resampling which is to use this. Uh, that, that um, here, if you go back to the original sample, here, oops. Um, this one. These are my original samples. You notice the, the two peaks the, the negative frequency peak and the positive frequency peak, or it seem like they're farther apart, but they're the same place they, they were in the, in the other figures, because this is only, only goes to minus 250 hertz to plus 250 hertz, rather than from minus 5 kilohertz up to plus 5 kilohertz. Um, so, but this looks just the same. It turns out that all you have to do to this is tack a bunch of zeros on at the end. Yeah, once you have this, if you tack a bunch of zeros on both ends and do an inverse FFT, you get back your original signal. Oops. Ah. You get back this. And this is exact. This is the this is the correct way under this for this signal. It's exact for this signal. It's not exact for all, but for this signal, it really is exact because there really are only three non-zero numbers in the entire thing each side. <laughs> um, and sometimes you'd actually want to do that. Now that the the and if your problem is that you have a sample, if, if the sample rate that you're trying to get to is a fixed integer multiple of the sample rate that you start with, then this becomes particularly easy to do. And if you can manage to make your window size a power of two, then it gets much more efficient because FFTs of powers of points are particularly efficient. Uh, so there are, there are circumstances in which if you're doing this problem of, of resampling something to a much higher sample rate, sometimes you want to do it this way. In this particular case, it's about a wash between this and the 15, uh, the, the order 15. Because the logarithm of the number of points is the log base 2 of the number of points is about 15. <laughs> so those are the two things that you have to compare. <laughs> um, so
So, but this is another way to do it. But this is it's effectively the order of this interpolation is the entire length of the signal. Every sig every input point goes into every output point. All right. And what does this look like? Um, the the bottom. This this is the nearest neighbor. The bottom. Uh, the next one up is, is linear. Now, what, we're, what, what you're seeing here is the interpolation weight function that's used. Uh, it's what gets multiplied by each input sample. Okay, if, uh, the each input sample here is at zero. Um, and um, the assumption is that there is there is there is one. This is focusing on the influence of one input sample on a range of output samples. Okay, so your uh, for the nearest neighbor it's obvious. For the the, the little triangle is the, the linear one, and you can in, increase more and more and more. And when you get up to the top, it looks kind of like a sync function. And again, looks even even when it's uh, at order three, it looks kind of like a truncated version or a windowed version of a sync function, even though it's not a sync, not computed that way. It's computed using the cubic polynomials, piecewise, piecewise cubic polynomials, and then the lines are where the non-zero values are. And that's, is clear? Okay. Now, interpolation, this kind of interpolation is uh, linear common. Does this always actually does show up on there? Good. Um, the, it's a linear tra transformation. And you just do matrix algebra. And it's matrix algebra. Once you compute the weights, uh, the, the weight matrix is a band matrix whose Whose, whose middle section is the order plus one wide. And everything else is zeros up in the upper right and zeros in the lower left. Uh, and the vector on the, um, on the right is, a, is the input samples, and the vector on the left is the output samples. So if you're going to do a whole lot of samples, uh, treating it as a linear algebra problem can get you means that you can call there's a, there's a, there are band matrix routines that are highly optimized and parallelizable and all of this stuff uh, and you, you call it a, a standard routine once you've computed the weights sometimes sometimes it takes longer to compute the weights so so the weights are I put in a tr you don't want to know the details but this is <laughs> it, it is a linear algebra problem now let's see um, There are some uh, other forms that are not linear algebra, such as rational functions, as as interpolants. Um, and I know of them, but I have never used them, so I'm not going to talk about them. <laughs> um, okay, that's clear. But that's that's the, that's the whole formula. Once you've got the weights. It's just linear out. Um, and then there's there's one more use case here. Uh, it's usually not the case with signals, but sometimes it is the case with um, trajectories, for example. We'll get into that. But sometimes you know, at, as your input samples, both the value of your function that you're interpolating and its first derivative at each of your samples. Uh, that's, for example, what we get for position in a in a trajectory, because because our snapshots have the velocity vector in them, so you can use that as the first time derivative of position. Uh, and um, there are each each, and you can compute. And once you have that, you can also compute the derivative, the, the first time derivative of your of your interval. 
Um, okay. And these are what they look like. Um, most people, most of the time we don't need to use these because we don't want our, the, the bottom two are the weight functions, like the weight functions we saw before, um, <coughs> or, um, okay, this is the, this is the cubic, these two are the cubic uh, polynomial interpolation weight functions, that, that uh, if, if we have a, you notice that this one is the weight function that you use to compute the function, uh, the, our output function given only, given the input function. This is, this computes, this one on the right computes the output, no, computes the output function and uses the first derivative at that same point to modify the values of your function. Now those top two are the ones that, that most people will need to know because what they want to know is the position. But if you want to know the velocity too at your interpolated points, then you need this second set of weights that the on the left, these are the, the influence of the function value at your sample points. Uh, and then y prime that's supposed to be. It's not, not very clear what that is, but that's the, the, the y prime is the y is a time derivative of, of y. Um, and um, it's the it's how you compute the function value based and, and the contribute contribution to the interpolated function value that comes from knowing the first derivative at your sample point. It's going to kick it up and down. By the way, this is the first derivative of that. <laughs> and this is the first derivative of that, which you notice the second derivative is discontinuous. But it's cubic. It's not supposed to be continuous. OK. Um, and it's piecewise cubic. Uh, and this is this is this is the contribution of the derivative of the of the input first derivative on the output first derivative, and and all of those go in in this, these equations: the, the left, right, left, right. Now. Um, General questions about about uh, interpolation. We'll get back to it. We'll do more interpolation here, uh, but now we're getting back into these projections. Um, scenario sketch. Um, there's a receiver somewhere. Uh, draw yourself a picture of a submarine there, <laughs> uh, or something. Uh, it has a trajectory, and there's a source over there, that's maybe another submarine, uh, and it has its own trajectory, and there's a delay, there's a time delay that the, that the sound takes to go from the source to the receiver, and that depends on how far apart they are, which is time dependent. So the Final, if your source signal is this x of t, then the received signal is proportional to x of t minus the delay. But it's a time dependent delay. <laughs> so, uh, so it's, it's, you're, you're told you've got to interpolate. This is, this is one of the reasons that interpolation is so important in this particular simulation problem. Because, because the, this delay between this sample signal over here and that sample signal over there is continuously varying through the, through the time. So you can't count on, on any particular relationship between the times at which you want your output and the times at which your input was produced. And then specify the trajectory. 
trajectory. Here, here's the way my software special specifies a trajectory. A, a, a trajectory is just a list of snapshots. Uh, a little bit of extra stuff, but it's mostly just a list of snapshots. And snapshot is an, an object uh, whose constructor looks like this. You, there's a time and a three vector with its position expressed in the Earth coordinate system. Uh, a, another three vector that is the velocity. Uh, a, it's not really a three vector, it's an orientation. It's got three, three members, head and pitch and roll, mostly. Three angles that, that determine the, the um, orientation and the time derivative of those. Um, this is how you make one. Um, but the main function of it is to transform vectors some kind of vector, you know, various kinds, and I'll get into what they are, uh, between the vehicle coordinate system as seen from the airplane. This, this thing knows it's, it's to starboard and down by a certain number of degrees. Then, whereas, by the way, our zero on our, on our Earth coordinate system, I have declared, is this spot right there, which is which is the origin of, of the, our Earth coordinate system, uh, and uh, x is that's north, so x is east, y is north, and z is up. I declare that that is the Earth coordinate system. Okay, um, and when when this flies around, the, its trajectory is expressed in that coordinate system. Um, but it's doing its measurements uh, in its own coordinate system. It knows, you know, it's doing this, uh, and it's measuring. It's when it's when it's pointing a camera and picking out something on the on the picture in the camera. Uh, all of those things. There's a coordinate system that that's, that's on the screen that they're watching. That somebody is watching. There's a coordinate system that's determined by this camera mount that somebody else is controlling, so that they keep this. this this nasty vehicle that they're following in the site. There's the coordinate system that is relative, that the airplane is doing relative, it's got to be moving here, it won't fly. So <laughs> the coordinate system that the airplane is doing relative to the Earth. And we're going to assume, in, in, in the last October scenario, we assume that all of those things are known. And that the, the question is, where is that vehicle down there? What is its trajectory relative to there? <clears throat> okay. Uh, so here's here's in, in our in, in our sonar problem is where this is applied in, in my software. Um, so we've got these twelve plus time, twelve degrees of freedom for three vectors uh, determine the state of this snapshot. Um, okay. So how do you use this to transform a vector? Now I'm going to get into a little bit of mathematics and computer stuff. So if, if one of the things we might want to do uh, is Let's specialize this a little bit. Where is the... We've got a big summary. Its trajectory is this. So the question is, where is the center of its hydrophone that it's actually listening to in the Earth coordinate system? Which is what you have to do in order to know about the sound propagation. Uh, when you know exactly where it is on the skin of the of the uh, the vehicle, the submarine that, that's driving around. So there's a there's a there's a vector that you know that's in uh, that you get it from the from the construction diagram of your, of your vehicle. Um, but you want to know where it is relative to the Earth so that you can do this 
sound propagation problem from the source to the receiver. Um, so to do this transformation, the, you have a location in the Earth coordinate system. You have a R prime is the same location that's expressed in the platform coordinate system, and you have this big R, which is the location of the platform relative to the Earth, and you have a right, we're not doing first derivatives this, this time, uh, and you have a rotation operator that is. Uh, taking a vector from the earth coordinate system to the platform coordinate system. And it it's describes the orientation of the airplane. Uh, or of the, I keep switching my, my, my vehicle, Olivia, whatever it is. Um, and it's a linear transformation. Uh, you, you, you're, Yeah, R, the R, R in the in the vehicle coordinate system uh, is the rotated form of the difference between the center, the vehicle center, and the uh, location as as uh, seen on the Earth, and the inverse transformation uh, transform from the Earth coordinate uh, is the. And this is this is the one we would use in the scenario I just outlined. That you know our prime, where it's mounted on the airplane, and you want to get R, which is where it is in space. Uh, and you have to rotate the airplane in order to find that out. So now this M, uh, in this particular application, M, what you want is a three by three matrix. Uh, you've got a vector on this side, three vector on this side, and you want to get another three vector, and it's a linear transformation. It's a three by three matrix. This one happens to be orthogonal. Uh, so, so when you rotate something, it doesn't grow. <laughs> it doesn't shift over there. You know, there, there are, there are. So these. Uh, so it is. Its, it's inverse is its transpose. Um, Okay. And what that what that means uh, let's, uh, is no wait a minute is is that um, although you have nine numbers in there, uh, there are only still only six degrees of freedom because this relationship implies six different constraints on on those numbers. Okay. <clears throat> Um, what are they? Well, it, it's, it's, it's easier to think about rotation in a plane or about one particular axis. So, and these are fairly familiar from computer graphics. Uh, the, 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 the heading, the rotation about the heading, uh, leaves the, the Z axis, which is up. Uh, Invariant, so these are ones and zeros, and the cosines on the diagonal and sine and minus sine on the off diagonals. And that's familiar from computer graphics. And then the same thing for y, um, a, a rotation about the y axis, which is this size, like I said, is north, um, which means that. Um, that is a roll, and it, it, depending on it, okay. Now let's let's say we started facing in the x direction. So yeah, anyway, those are those are mx the 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 rotation about your three axes. The reason I'm having trouble is that the coordinate systems that I normally use are not these. The coordinate systems that I normally use are the Vehicle coordinate system is forward, starboard, and down, and below. And the Earth coordinate system is north, east, and down. Because the zero is at the surface. I'm underwater. Yeah. That's that's where that's where that's that's the invariant plane in this in this whole problem. So the zero is up there, 
and and we want we so don't want to deal with negative yeah. numbers, so if we have a positive and down. Positive and positive and is. Yeah, so it's northeast and down <laughs> is, is the coordinate system that's used for underwater acoustics in in most underwater acoustics applications. Uh, and th this is hard for some people to get their head around, but but having worked in it for so many years, I've now had difficulties getting a, a different one would be east, north, and up, in that order, x is east, uh, and, that, and a lot of people who work above, work in air, like most of us, you like to use that one, <laughs> because then x and y are east and north, which is, which is like, like a plot. Oh, yeah. And then up is, is z is up out of the paper. Um, It's right, all the transformations are orthogonal, so you're okay. Yeah, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter which, which one you're in, you just have to know <laughs> if you want to make sense of it. Um, okay, and the successive rotations are matrix multiplications, so this one in the middle is what you end up with if you actually go through by hand and do that matrix multiplication. You get this big part. Um, the, um, and we can we can sort of count the count the operations. Uh, computing m takes fifteen multiplications. Uh, once you've got the sines and cosines, but plus three sines and three cosines. I should have put those in. Um, and a, a matrix 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 vector multiplication is nine, and you can do it separately with the x and the y and the z, and that make that makes it twelve, unless someone was zero, which gets you know you don't always have any roll. Often you ignore that in. Okay. Um, now I've sort of already done that. Um, the, the problem is we want, you know, we've got, it's here at one time, and it's over here at another time, and you want to make some sort of a minimal continuous motion between those. Uh, and how, how do you do that? Well, interpolation, you do some linear transformation. It's easy for the, for the, look, for the position and the velocity. Those are, those are vector spaces. A vector space has an addition amp operator, and it has an operator that's a multiplication by a scalar. Those are what you get when you have a vector. Those are the operations you get. You don't get a multiplication. Um, <clears throat> and, that's, and those are the operations that we can use for interpolating using the same weight functions that we use for the signal. Those, the, 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 with the, the ones with the, the ones with the derivatives in that last that last set that you saw the ones that they use the derivatives you use those cubic interpolation in between and it works just hunky dory for uh, for position and velocity. What do you do for rotation for the orientation? Um, you want to be able to go. The problem is. The first rotation is around the z-axis, the up-axis. Uh, and sometimes, in these things, you want to do it, uh, or you want to be able to, uh, for, okay, one of, the, one of the problems that I'm currently working with, a sonar problem, is that it's a sonar, it's a down-looking sonar, it's looking straight down and looking for things on the bottom. Uh, but, but if you, Passing right over something, then then what was uh, the forward the then if you're you doing heading face heading pitch and roll, then you're passing over something. The heading at which you see it starts at zero, let's say, and then you pass over it, and all of a sudden it's 180. Uh, so heading pitch and roll. 
are not good parameters to use for interpolation. What else have we got? Well, we've got that 9 by 9 matrix. Well, the yeah, matrix is a vector space. You can theoretically do those, but once you, once you multiply an orthogonal rotation matrix by a scalar, it's no longer orthogonal. It's not a rotation. So you can't interpolate directly that rotation matrix. So, those, so far we've got two representations of the matrix. The one that you want to use for your transformations and the one that you, that you get from your user when you, start the pro when you specify the problem. Got to be something in between. Quaternions. Uh, in the specifically unit quaternions. Now, quaternion is four numbers, uh, and uh, the abstract definition is a quaternion is a set of four real numbers with two operations, an addition and a multiplication. Um, and it's usually expressed, and the first one acts just like a scalar, and the other three act sort of like a vector, and we'll, we'll take, take uh, advantage of that. There are unit vectors, okay, they're, they're, they're the x, y, and z unit vectors, that you, it's kind of like i is a unit vector in, in, in ordinary complex arithmetic, i is a unit vector, and one is the other unit vector, two-dimensional. Well, this has, this has three different versions of i. <laughs> Okay, um, and it has some some nice some nice properties. Um, addition works just like the vectors; you just add the components. The multiplication is somewhat more complicated, but it's reminiscent of multiplication by complex numbers. It's you know you, all of the inputs go into all of the outputs. All, all four inputs on each one go into all four outputs. Uh, in general, um, and this is this is what the the multiplication actually looks like. Uh, what do you get from that? Um, the, the 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 value in quaternions is not the quaternion space itself. Um, There's a, there's a name for this. It's a, yeah, I forgot. Well, the, the, there's a mathematical name for this. It's a vector algebra. Uh, division ring. <laughs> division algebra. <laughs> anyway, it's, 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 a, it, it's got all of the, all of the same uh, uh, operations that real numbers do, um, but more so. And they're not, and the, the, the main difference is that multiplication is not, um, it, it's associative but not commutative. Mm -hmm. One rotation followed by another is not the same as the second rotation followed by the first. And you can see that, okay, I'm going to rotate uh, this airplane. Uh, 45 degrees down and 45 degrees to the right. 45 degrees down, 45 degrees to the right. I'm pointing at my little thingy there. If I go 45 degrees to the right, now that's still more or less the same. I guess you have to do all three. Um, okay. 45 down, 45 right, and 45 roll. So it's going to look like this. It's pitched, pointing down there. Now if I go the roll first, remember you have to do the second one, and then down, and then to the right, it's, it, it's, it's a whole different thing if you, if you reverse the, the, uh, uh, the order of it. So it's non-commutative. As the rotation, uh, so the, the, the the quaternion maps onto rotations in that sense, that they're both non-commutative and they, they both have the same, the same, basically the same property. They, they, they are mathematically the same. 
of a sub Now, <coughs> I, I skipped ahead a bit. Subspaces, their properties. Quaternions of the form a number and, a, and three zeros are, are isomorphic to the real numbers. Everything you do to the real numbers, you do to that to get the same answer. Okay. Quaternions of this other form, two things, two, two non zeros and two zeros, is isomorphic to the complex numbers. Everything, anything you can do to the complex numbers, you do to this, you get the same answer. In particular, it's closed under that operation that if you multiply two numbers that are of that form that have only two, the first two non-zeros, uh, then the answer is going to have only the first two non-zeros. Uh, uh, another, and so, so that is in fact a, a sub, -al that's an algebra, that's an algebra, a sub-algebra. Uh, the traceless quaternions, which is a zero and three non-zero, are isomorphic to 3D vectors. But you can anything you do to those, but 3D vectors don't have a multiplication. You do. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the multiplication isn't closed. This, this particular subset is not closed under multiplication. Because you can have two numbers of that of that sense, of that uh, form, and uh, multiply them don't get another number of that form. Another, another quaternion of that form. A zero goes away. Uh, so, it's, so it's not an algebra, because it doesn't have a multiplication that's closed. Uh, but it's a vector space. Um, then there are unit quaternions, which is a subspace of quaternions in which the sums of the squares is one. That is the subspace of the quaternions that maps onto rotation. It's, uh, it's a group in mathematical terms. Um, and uh, it's closed only under multiplication. You can't add these together and stay in the, in the subspace. In the group, it had, the group then has only one operation on it, which is multiplication. And it's associative, uh, and uh, but it's non-commutative. Now it's distributes over addition, but then you're not in this sub. So forget addition. It's forget scalar multiplication. Uh, and this is the subgroup of the quaternions that we're primarily in. Unit quaternions. Um, so, if you, but it, it, a coordinate transformation, I'm not going to prove this, but but the coordinate transformation looks a bit different. It's not a matrix multiplication. It's what's called a, a quadratic form. That is, you multi, you pre-multiply, you, you multiply with, by one thing on the on the right and by its in transverse. So the transform two that was just this matrix multiplication uh, becomes p prime now the, the corresponding vector if if p the p and capital P is a quaternion form of the, the vectors that we're interested in and it's got zeros in the first position uh, and you multiply it by two unit quaternions, or a unit quaternion on the right and by its transverse on the, uh, on the left, in the inverse. Um, it does, it gets the, it, it maps, it's, it gets you the same answer that you get if you did, if you, tra if you use the, Three by three rotation matrix to do that rotation, but it's a, quadr it's a uh, quadratic form rather than a multi multi multiplication. Um, okay, a cost is twenty-four multiplications, which is more than it takes. I mean, I'm using multiplications as a, as a proxy. Complexity of the algorithm. It's, it's, that's 
not the only thing that matters, but it's, it's something we can talk about here. Um, so it's the, you would do this only if you it didn't pay you to compute the three by three multiplication, well, the three by three matrix, the, the orthogonal matrix that we showed before. Uh, so it depends on how many of these vectors you want to transform using the same matrix. If you're going to transform a gazillion vectors using the same matrix, which you might do, for example, if you know. You are now at this point, and you want to you want to learn about where that bird is and where that car is and where this thing is. You're transforming a whole lot of things that are that are being sensed by this in this coordinate system, and transforming them all back to Earth or vice versa uh, with the same multiplication matrix. You definitely want to compute your three by three multiplication matrix and representation of the rotation and use that. If you're only going to do one, you're better off doing this. <coughs> um, okay, now another way to, to think about quaternions um, is as a the, the scalar vectors. The, the first the first one acts kind of like a scalar, and the last three act like kind of like a vector. And when you put them together in a rotation, that kind of gets lost a little bit, but it's there under the covers. Um, in that form, you can do the multiplication. It, you know, it's the, this the, it's a zero, which is a scalar plus a vector. Uh, or, it shouldn't be a plus, it's, a, it's a, <laughs> uh, appended. Um, but if you express it in that form, then your multiplication has a different form, where now um, this is just multiplication of a two scalars. This is a multiplication of a scalar by a vector, which we know how to do. There's another of those. And then this, these last two points are, turns out, the dot product and cross product of the two vectors. Uh, the <coughs> <coughs> this is a scalar, and this is another vector. Um, and the cross product, you are somewhat familiar from physics problems involving torque. Uh, <coughs> twisting, any kind of twisting things. Um, now here's a, here's a punchline. <clears throat> there is a third, a fourth. We've, got, we've already have, we have, now have three representations of the rotation grid. Getting control, or three angles anyway. You can pitch which angles they are, pick which angles they are. Uh, three by three, a bottom matrix, unit quaternion. But there's also another one because you can you can show uh, that for any rotate a theorem is that any rotation um, for any any transformation from one coordinate system to another coordinate system there is one direction such that a vector that's along that direction is invariant under that rotation no matter what the rotation is there is an invariant direction. That's sort of the axis of your rotation. <clears throat> um, and it turns out that you can find out, um, you can prove that if you if you take the a, the a vector along that direction and rotate it and that you get you get that. But if you take a vector that's in the direction of the, the, the three, the, the last three components of your, of your rotation, it turns out that that vector that's extracted from the quaternion is in the invariant direction. Uh, and so you can express a rotation then, the fourth way, is as a vector along that 
invariant direction whose magnitude is the angle through which you rotate. Uh, and that's relatively easy to think about once you, once you realize that there is such an invariant direction. Um, Can you just explain that in the last 60 seconds one more time? Okay. <clears throat> It's the same, the same thing. I mean, you get playing a different way. Yeah. Um, okay. This vector alpha is part of the correct of the of the quaternion that is describing this a particular rotation. If you take that alpha. It turns out, that, and here's, here's, here's the punchline that I kind of left out, um, that the, th this is a representation of this vector in terms of the quaternion. This is the first component of the quaternion. This vector is the, is the last three components of the, of the quaternion. Uh, and uh, U is a unit vector. Uh, in the direct, in the invariant direction. It turns out that you can you can show that if you that you can pick out this this theta by looking at the, the the magnitude of u and the magnitude of this of the, of the first one and and figuring out what 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 the angle is there, uh, and you can back that out and get u, which is a unit vector along the invariant direction. And if you you can sh you can prove that. If you take this vector, which is this vector that's the, the last component of the, of the uh, quaternion, last three components of the quaternion, transform them in the usual way uh, uh, using, using the, the quaternion as a rotation. So this is a rotation, this is a rotation, that's a vector that's extracted from the same rotation. Uh, it's a variant. You get the same vector back. Uh, and that, that's sort of the way to, to convince yourself. I haven't actually proven it because I didn't go through the details. <clears throat> but that's the way to convince yourself that that is, a, in fact, the invariant. Uh, so we found the axis vector we need to do the interpolation. So, okay, once we have a quaternion, now we can do interpolation because uh, all we have to do is is, is interpolate in theta. Now we have this expressed in terms of theta, and we want to interpolate along that sort of so great almost, circle. Great so circle. It's almost linear now or something. Great circle. Yeah, it's, it, we can now do the arithmetic. Like half the, if you go half the way, it's, it's it, yeah. linear, it's not the best word, but it's, it's not going to like grow or shrink something. Right. It's going to be a, a true rotation. Right, it's going to be a true rotation once you rotate it that, that way. You can't use that, what, and the, but that vector is good only for inter interpolation. And, and you know, you, you have the vector here, the vector here. You can interpolate those vectors and you get a very reasonable, very smooth rotation. You can just interpolate from that vector to that vector. And you treat it like a vector. <clears throat> uh, we know how to interpolate the vectors. We do it for the position and the velocity already. So we do it for those vectors, position and first derivative. Use the same weight functions versus this scalar, which is the angle, uh, that we used for doing the other kind of interpolation. Then you have to transform it back to a quaternion, and from there back to your three by three matrix to use it again to transform <laughs> transform vectors. So, but those are all pretty straightforward. Okay, here's quaternion. Okay. Um, yeah, now, now we're doing, I'm going to go quickly through this. This is actual C++ code. It's, it's edited for showing for, for this. 
uh, and uh, and I'm assuming that that the the quaternion a okay orientation is just heady picture roll. Uh, a spinner is something I I've, I've renamed years ago. Uh, it's really a unit quaternion. I called it spinner because I came from my my graduate work was in, in uh, quantum mechanics and spin quantum mechanics. The spinner has, has the same same arithmetic. There are quaternions in that too. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, same math. <coughs> um, okay, so you have to do the sines and cosines of half angles. Not the full angles. To go from heading, pitch, and roll to the quaternion, you go with half angles. Because remember, you, you apply them twice, once on the front, one, once on the back, into a vector. But uh, sines and cosines of all the three, of half, of half of the three angles. And then there's this arithmetic, which is straightforward. Just uh, Sums and sums and m and, uh, and those those are the, the four components of the unit function. The cost then is six trig functions plus sixteen multiplications, and there are some some uh, sub expressions and stuff in there that you can eliminate. So it's less than sixteen that I don't bother to actually count. <coughs> um, so the conclusion, which is pretty expensive. But well, all that means is you use heading, pitch, and roll only for input from the user, only <coughs> if you have to, or to output to the user to tell it what's going on. Uh, otherwise, you stick, you stick with the other, the other three forms to do actual computations. So. Okay. <clears throat> then, going from a unit quaternion to a rotation matrix, Three by three orthogonal matrix with its six constraints. Um, here's a, a, another pretty, fairly complicated, but not that easy to under, understand what's going. Easy to see what's going on. The cost is these ten multiplications. Uh, there's a bunch of additions, but. but but no trig functions. So it's really, in 10 multiplications, really is not bad to go from a quaternion to the full matrix. Then you, then you're, that's, that's the most efficient form for transforming vectors. So that's the one you actually use to, to do the work. <clears throat> then going from the unit quaternion to the rotation vector is this one. Uh, that, uh, <clears throat> that I'm using the, the there's boost, boost boost has a quaternion library it turns out and I, and I because I did this long before boost existed it, in, it, it doesn't use boost library my my software does not use the boost library uh, but uh, for for talking about it I I borrowed the terminology from the boost library. So, so uh, uh, we've got. Let me go over here. Um, it's not terrible. It's, it's actually rather rather uncomplicated <coughs> because there's. Only one one trig function, which you need in order to to to, to sort of renormalize the vector that's on. You, it, it, you, what you want is this vector that's the that's the second, third, and fourth components, but it's not normalized correctly when it's in the quaternion. So you do a little bit of arithmetic and one trig function and one square root and six multiplications and a division, and you get to get from that to. Um, uh, the, the rotation vector that you need in order to do the, 
do the interpolation. It's almost time to quit, but I'm not, I'm not far from the end of it. <coughs> then uh, you can go from the road. Once you've done your, your interpolation by doing ordinary vector arithmetic, then you can go back to the unit quaternion. You're doing this way, and it's, it's uh, two trig functions and four multiplications. <coughs> uh, pretty quick, but it does have trig functions. Now, interpolating. Now, this is a version of interpolating a rotation. This is sort of puts some of those together uh, to interpolate to interpolate from this rotation from the pre-rotation to the next rotation. Uh, and uh, the weight tells how far, how far do you want to go between this rotation and the next one. Or your, what's the percentage of how far, how far in between them do you want to go. Um, I'll tell you, you've got your spinner, and you divide by the previous rotation spinner. So you get these, the spinner, the, the quaternion corresponding to the change in orientation. Uh, you compute the vector for that change in orientation. You scale it, uh, multiply it times, times a weight so you only get part of it. Uh, and then you take, go to the, the, to the quaternion from the vector. They go back to a quaternion, and uh, and then you multiply by the previous the the the, road, the, road, the quaternion of the previous uh, rotation, uh, and you multiply it by the spin delta, and you've done. That is a linear rotation. Now the one I actually use is is a cubic one, which looks like. Some of those that I it, it this this illustrates the, the principle. Uh, you can expand on this because we know not only the, the rotation but the uh, time rate of change of the rotation. So you can do essentially the same thing with those uh, those two vectors as you would do for position and uh, velocity vectors. You can use those to, to, to compute a, a nice smooth rotation that's, that's continuous in both the value of the first derivative. Uh, and this is, yeah, <coughs> time to review zero. Um, and the, 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 the way, uh, the rotation actually has several of the different forms coexisting inside it, the rotation object, so you don't have to go back and forth each time. Uh, the central representation is the quaternion, even though the source representation is the three angles. Uh, and it computes the, the, the other two representations as needed, and remembers and caches them so it doesn't have to recompute them if it hasn't changed. <coughs> Um, cost of this is three trigs, one square root, 22 multiplications, and, and again, if there are many interpolation points between the same two rotations, some of these steps you don't have to do so many times, uh, which is often the case if you're going from a, from a sparse remote rotation to a much denser rotation, denser uh, seven, seven samples. Summary. Four representations. Uh, the orientation angles, used only for human readable. Uh, matrix, most efficient for transforming vectors, but you can't do anything else with it. You can't do anything else once you've got that. Uh, you probably could. If you the unit quaternion, which is the central representation from which all of the others are relatively easy to compute. And the rotation vector, which you need to do your interpretation. Uh, 
You need all four for a for a real efficient efficient 3D show. Like <coughs> my throat is finished, and so am I.